So the international break is over. It's time we return with the roundups, delving deep into some of the best moments from this weekend in Sky Bet League One. Let's go. As always, if you do find value from the content, please make sure you subscribe and leave a like. We're on the road to 7,000 subscribers. It really does help me grow the podcast and reach new audiences. Let's begin with the first game at Fratton Park. It's Portsmouth against Blackpool. Of course, it finishes Portsmouth nil, Blackpool 4, the XG 1.02 to 1.36. Blackpool humiliate Portsmouth at Fratton Park as the home side's impressive 27-game unbeaten run comes to an end. Let's touch on Portsmouth first. It's probably going to be described as an afternoon for most Pompey fans to forget. Anything that could have gone wrong did. A severe lack of control, positivity in possession and overall quality for large spells. A display that you'd never associate with a John Massinho side of this season whatsoever. As much as Blackpool were brilliant throughout, Portsmouth never snapped into gear and almost let the game whistle past them with complete ease. But Blackpool, they deserve the credit. It was a phenomenal showing, an utter dismantling of a side that sat top of League One in coming into this game. Questions have been asked as to whether there's a consistent threat in the final third so far this season. Yesterday, it was a masterclass in forward play by the Seasiders. We can dive into the tactics until the cows come home, but ultimately, the relentless forward intent and fearless nature of Blackpool were the most effective traits in this game. When taking a look at the graph brought to you by SofaScore, Portsmouth were punished for a slow start, learning very quickly a lapse in control would be costly. We then see the home side find their familiar groove, complete domination with patience in possession. But unlike so many times this season, the end product was lacking. The sending off of Joe Morrell didn't help whatsoever, but in rare circumstances for Pompey, the graph visualises the opposition finding far more rhythm, subsequently killing the game off quickly. When looking at the stats, the numbers don't usually lie and also show Portsmouth just weren't at the races. We've spoken so often about the principles involved in the success of Massinho's side already this season. However, so many of those key ingredients were missing yesterday. In the second half, Portsmouth only managed 40% possession, one of their lowest numbers they've had since Massinho was appointed. For context, their average possession count so far this season is 58%. But some will say possession counts for nothing. It's all about the output. Well, Portsmouth, they had none of that too. Obviously, no goals, zero big chances were created and only five shots on goal one of those were from inside the box. It was a terrible day at the office in most departments and by some distance, the bleakest Portsmouth display of the season so far. When looking at key players, I can tell you who wasn't bleak. CJ Hamilton, the man tore Portsmouth apart down that right-hand side. Before we touch on Hamilton in more detail, look how advanced Neil Critchley wants his Blackpool wing-backs to play in possession. Take a look at the Blackpool average positions. Normally, you'd see one side with a deeper wide player, not in this case. The bravery was so impressive. Neil Critchley demanded his wingbacks to be so advanced. Number 7, Owen Dale. Number 22, Hamilton almost double up on both sides, becoming extra wingers. Blackpool in possession almost played a 3-2-5, suffocating this Portsmouth team to a point where they couldn't react and couldn't counteract in an attacking sense. But coming back to CJ Hamilton, the man was, as Tom described on TLOP this week, an absolute joke. He played a crucial role in the tactical decision to overload the wide areas. In total, he accumulated three goal contributions, one goal and two assists, five chances created, five key passes, six passes into the final third and the most touches inside the opposing box out of anybody else on the Fratton Park pitch with a total of seven. He caused a constant threat throughout with a brilliant involvement in three of the four Blackpool goals. Next up, Lincoln 2, Barnsley 2. The non-penalty XG was 1.26 to 1.22. It's a dramatic late goal that ensures Lincoln share the points with playoff chasers Barnsley. When looking at Lincoln in more detail, in one of their most bright performances of the season, Lincoln showed great character in Skabala's first home game in charge. It was by no means perfect, but the improvement is clear, and it's fair to say the identity is slowly emerging. The confidence is growing, but the non-negotiables are being established early in the new manager's reign. More on those non-negotiables in a few moments' time. When looking at Barnsley with any result, it can be spanned in multiple ways, but I get the gist. Barnsley fans do see this as two points dropped. It was a performance that had glimpses of quality, but consistent threat and control was lacking throughout. I'd use the word, and I've used it quite a lot this season, when describing various teams 
patchy. It felt very, very patchy. We often focus on identity more than we need to, but I actually think the often pragmatic Barnsley style of play is highlighting the issue's instability at the back. Again, more on that later, but it's really interesting. I think the style of play or lack of style of play is hindering so many aspects of this Barnsley setup. We're looking at the graph in front of you now. It's clear Barnsley enjoyed more of the ball, especially in the first half, but the attacking output was very even. Just look at the expected goals and the, the non-penalty XG, because of course Lincoln did convert a penalty very early on. I'm still struggling to put my finger on a clear Barnsley style of play. As the graph suggests, quality only came in brief glimpses without a sustained spell. We're looking at the stats in front of you heading into the final third. The Barnsley frustrations remain. It feels passive and on too many occasions with a spark missing in creation. With 62% of the ball, the away side only matched Lincoln with the number of shots on target and actually created two big chances less over the 90 minutes. The Barnsley midfield of Herbie Kane, Luca Connell and Callum Styles failed to create a single big chance across the match. That is terrible. A midfielder not creating a single chance is unacceptable. It's far too pragmatic and defensive-minded, leaving attackers to live off scraps. At Lincoln, things look brighter, so much brighter, and Skubala's side have picked up in most departments on a footballing level, but the mental traits of character and resilience look on a different level too. The late goal and the desire to go on and win the game beyond that point is a great example of that. When looking at the average positions, sometimes we expect a huge huge overhaul stylistically when a new manager comes through the door, whereas the improvement in the basics have been clear for Lincoln. The compact and well-organised nature of this side have made it very difficult for them to be beaten, creating a brilliant defensive structure in and out of possession. That tight double pivot in front of the back line adds a spine with plenty of freedom for the four players to express themselves. I've been very impressed with Lincoln and yesterday it was a really good showing. It finishes Cheltenham 2, Oxford United nil. the XG 0.9 to 1.39. It wasn't the romantic homecoming for Des Buckingham, but instead a harsh lesson into the robust and brutal nature of Sky Bet League 1. When looking at Cheltenham first, to put it bluntly, Cheltenham did a number on Oxford, and as game plans go, it was executed perfectly. The better team with the better game plan won this game. They found a great success from staying compact in the middle, average positions to come on that front, making the pitch feel small and playing direct at every given opportunity. It was expected, but so, so effective. Man advantage or not, the impressive organisation and physical presence demanded answers from Oxford throughout the game, and I'd say the answers that were never really found. We're looking at Oxford United in more detail. It was one frustrating afternoon, a game where Oxford never quite clicked into gear. It was not dissimilar to the game at Cambridge and even at Cheltenham a couple of seasons ago. Every now and again, that low block and teams playing that low block will kill us. Oxford have proven they have the ability to break one down. Stevenage, a great example of that, but it's the speed at which we get desperate that can let us down big time. On a footballing level, Oxford had half-decent spells, but the failure to convert and habit to fall into the Cheltenham trap was a recipe for disaster. We're looking at the graph in front of you now. The graph highlights a few important takeaways from this clash. Three in particular. Let's touch on each one of those. Number one, Cheltenham's far start caught Oxford off guard. Although we didn't concede, the intention of Cheltenham's game plan was set out from the first minute. And you have to ask the question, did Oxford ever settle in this game? The second takeaway, Cheltenham had a clinical edge about them, converting from most of their brief spells they had in the final third. And finally, number three, although Oxford failed to get a complete hold of this game, as they would have wanted to, they were wasteful at times and lacked the instinctive touch in and around the box. Statistically, there aren't many surprises. Both sides created two big chances each, and that's the difference. One side took them, the other side didn't. Sometimes it's as simple as that. From the first minute, it felt like a close physical contest where the fine margins would be crucial. A side that misses the majority of their opportunities really would struggle. In this case, all of their opportunities. How Ruben didn't convert, and out of all the players on form right now to convert that chance, it would be him, and he skyrockets it over the crossbar one of those days. I don't like singling out individuals and it's not always of their own doing, but Mark Harris failed to register a single shot in a game for the fourth time this season. 
That's a number that concerns me. We're looking at key players, and speaking of strikers that were on form, Will Goodwin was a nuisance all afternoon. His tour, physical, bat-to-goal presence caused Thornley and Negro issues all afternoon. And when it comes to a battle, Goodwin won. That wasn't meant to be a punt. I literally saw that written down and said, that, that could be funny. It wasn't. It could have been. He won the most duels out of any player on the pitch with 12. He won the most ground duels with eight and won the most aero duels out of any Cheltenham player with a total of four. And of course, a crucial second in the game. He was fantastic. And like I say, he caused the Oxford backline problems throughout this match. When summing up and giving my final points on it, Daryl Clark got every aspect of his game plan spot on and I'd actually probably say guided Cheltenham to their best performance of the season. A clear structure defensively, a narrow and direct build up through the middle, that's why that appointment will give them a fighting chance this season. The final game in real detail, Bolton 7, Exeter 0, the XG 3.38 to 0 0.07, Bolton leapfrog Oxford and Portsmouth to reach top spot and you could say they did it in style. 7-0, incredible. Let's touch on Bolton first. Not many superlatives can describe just how good this Bolton team is right now. I'd use the word perfect. They certainly were perfect yesterday, that's for sure. In a moment, I'll show you one of the most one-sided attacking graphs to date. There's utter domination and there's that Bolton showing yesterday afternoon. With 17 goals and four clean sheets and a six-game winning run in the league, it's clear to see why confidence is oozing from every aspect of this Bolton Wanderers squad. Superb. When looking at Exeter, the club may have been very transparent with the future of Gary Caldwell, but losing 7-0 to any side must throw a spanner into the works. The sheer golf in quality was evident throughout with Exeter comfortably on the back foot and totally reactive after the first goal was conceded. That's now nine league games without a win and eight of those being a defeat. It's dreadful. It's so, so bad. And you can be, like I say, as transparent as you want about the future of your manager. You can back him forever. But that type of form is only sending you in one direction. It starts with R, ends in N. It's relegation. We're looking at the graph in front of you. Now it is pretty crazy. Have you ever seen a graph like this? Could it get more one-sided? There's been dominant and there's that. Especially in the second half, Bolton were totally rampant and absolutely blew this Exeter side away. You almost felt as if they blew Exeter back to Exeter. It was that rampant going forward. It sounds crazy when a side finishes with a 7-0 victory, but it was a slow start to the game. It took a while for Bolton to find their feet, but when they did, it was lift off and utter destruction. The stats don't paint a prettier picture from an Exeter perspective. It's ugly from every angle. The XG of 0.07 is a damning story on its own, but it gets worse. One shot taken in 90 minutes, zero shots on target, and worse still, centre-back Czech Diabate, their striking option up top. For Bolton, it's different reading and extremely impressive. From 24 shots, 10 hit the target, creating seven big chances along the way. To visualise just how many efforts this is, take a look at their shot map. Scattered in and around the penalty box, a masterclass in attacking output. It's one hell of a shot map. You can see lots and lots of efforts from in and around the penalty box. And if you don't laugh, you'll cry. Take a look at the away side shot map. I'm, I mean, look at it. It's lonely. The lonely effort wasn't even saved. In fact, Baxter didn't save a single shot in this match. It was terrible and just highlights the very, very clear issues that Exeter are currently experiencing. When looking at the average positions, the direction of this game is visualised very, very clearly. Only two Exeter players averaged more of the game inside the opposing half. Exeter attempted to soak up pressure in that low block, but very quickly, the depth of their organisation just invited more trouble, and ultimately trouble they just couldn't defend. When looking at key players in this preferred Ian Everett system, ensuring the double strike partnership is providing consistent output is crucial. The creative talent from midfield and advancing wingbacks isn't a new trend, but the conversion is getting better by the week. Compared to last season, they're averaging a higher number of goals per game at 2.2, big chances per game at 2.4, total shots per game at 3.9, and shots on target per 90 with 5 all of those numbers, that's all of those metrics are higher than those that were calculated from last season. Yesterday, Dion Charles and Adebeja were incredible and they certainly did deliver three goal involvements, including two from Charles, while Adebeja scored from his only shot in the game. Very, very impressive. It's 7-0. 
it is Sublime. This team are only heading in one direction and it's forwards. I'm concerned when we play them on Tuesday night because they are going to be purring after that performance against Exeter. 7-0, the final score. So around the grounds we go, of course, Bolton 7, Exeter 0, Carlisle 1, Charlton 1, Cheltenham 2, Oxford 0, Derby County 2, Bristol Rovers 1, Fleetwood 0, Stevenage 3, Leighton Orient 1, Wigan 1, Lincoln 2, Barnsley 2, Northampton 2, Cambridge United 1, Peterborough 4, Burton 0, Pompey 0, Blackpool 4, Shrewsbury 2, Port Vale 1, and Wickham 1, Reading 2. And that is just about everything. Thank you so much for tuning in. Like I said at the start, if you do find value, please make sure you subscribe and leave a like. Over 100 likes would be really, really kind. And I'll see you extremely soon. Take care.